On behalf of USAID and Resilience Links, I welcome you to Russia's war on Ukraine and its impacts on global resilience. I'm Sophie Fontaine with Resilience Links. Before we begin, let me orient you to the BlueJeans platform. On the right side of the screen, you'll see most of your controls. Firstly, if you haven't done so already, please use the chat to introduce yourself. To ask questions throughout the webinar, please use the Q&A button on the bottom right. When possible, please indicate which presenter your question is for. If the presentation is too small on your screen, use the slide bar at the bottom of the window to adjust your view. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and will email you the post-event resources shortly following the event. You can also find more resources on resiliencelinks.org. Hello. You can now see our agenda for today on your screen. Following some brief opening remarks from Michael Coons, a Senior Knowledge Management Advisor at USAID's Center for Resilience, we will hear a detailed technical presentation on the impacts of the war in Ukraine on different aspects of global resilience from Tim Frankenberger, Luca Russo, John Ulumengu, Goli Karuchi, and Vidya Saran. After the technical presentations, we've reserved plenty of time for a Q&A session. Thank you for your attendance today. I'll now pass it to Michael. Thank you, Sophie, and thanks to the entire team for organizing this webinar on Russia's, on Russia's war on Ukraine and its impacts on global resilience. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Great to see such an impressive turnout today. As a member of the global resilience community, USAID Center for Resilience is keenly interested in sharing knowledge, learning opportunities to build resilience among households, communities, and systems. Russia's war in Ukraine is exacerbating already high levels of global insecurity. These have resulted from a combination of the COVID-19 pandemic, climate shocks, protracted conflict, humanitarian crisis, as well as above average global food prices. Some of you may be familiar with the US government's global food security strategy. This is an integrated whole of government approach that aims to end hunger, to end global hunger, poverty, and malnutrition through the Feed the Future initiative. One of the main objectives of the global food security strategy is to strengthen resilience among people and systems by increasing efforts to sustainably lift communities from entrenched poverty, combat intense shocks. Building, on, building global resilience is essential to respond to the interconnected challenges that are exacerbated by Russia's war in Ukraine. For example, it's alarming that up to 40 million additional people could be pushed into poverty and food insecurity in 2022 due to the secondary impacts of the war. Recognizing that this crisis is global in nature and will require a long-term response, enhancing partnerships among donors is essential to increasing funding to prevent a global food crisis. Together with the international community, the G7 have provided and pledged additional support since the start of the war, exceeding $24 billion for 2022 and beyond. This includes an announcement this week that the United States, through USAID, has established a $100 million agriculture resilience initiative, which aims to bolster Ukrainian agriculture exports and to help alleviate the global food security crisis exacerbated by Putin's brutal war on Ukraine. We are looking forward to hearing from our speakers today about many of the important initiatives underway to increase global resilience capacity, which is so important to helping local organizations improve the well being of the many people around the world who are impacted by this war. The Resilience Links Forum gives us an opportunity to consider insights that can inform and inspire effective responses to local needs in a way that mobilizes investment, people, and systems well as to protect and improve human well-being in the face of shocks. Thank you to all of our speakers and everyone who helped make this webinar possible. And thanks again to everyone for joining today. I'll now hand it over to Dr. Tim Frankenberger, who is the president of Tango International. Welcome, Tim. Thanks for joining us today, and over to you. Thanks, Michael. Um, so, you know, I, I, it's a real pleasure to uh, be with you today and, and to be able to, to introduce to you our distinguished guests that are going to be talking on this topic. 
I think that what Michael has tried to emphasize is that the main expected effect of this Russian war on Ukraine on global food security uh, has a lot to do with what access people have to grain and energy and, ha and the fertilizer supplies that people are, are dealing with. And so international food and fuel prices have increased sharply since the onset of the conflict. And ultimately it will affect local food prices and access to food. At the same time, grain and oil price hikes have increased the cost of humanitarian operations, reducing aid organizations' ability to serve those in need when it most required. Today, we have a panel of experts who will discuss the implications of this supply shortfall on food security and resilience globally and what can be done about it. Um, our first speaker is Luca Rousseau, who is an agricultural economist with FAO. Um, his main expertise is in food security, resilience, and protracted crisis and related policy and analytical frameworks. Um, he is uh, currently the team leader of the Senior Food Security Crisis Analysis in the Office of Emergency and Resilience, where he leads major food security and resilience related analytical work, such as the food security phase classification system that's used to determine where crisis is likely to be happening. He also uh, is involved with early warning for early action and the resilience index for measurement, uh, the REMA approach that FAA uses. He's also the co-chair of UNFSSHDP coalition. So finally, uh, he leads work in promoting resilience food systems and food security in fragile areas and uh, what context uh, we need to take into account. He, he will be speaking about Russia-Ukraine crisis and how it's exacerbating the existing food security crises around the world. He will be focusing on some of the key drivers of these food crises and how these crises feed on each other and the need for a paradigm shift in the way we deal with these potential systems collapses that we're going to be facing. After Luca, we'll have John Umlawingo from IFPRI. He's a senior research fellow at, at the International Food Policy Research Institute. Uh, he holds a PhD in agriculture economics and a master's in economics from Ohio State University and a master's of arts in development economics from Williams College. His interest includes resilience and food systems, poverty dynamics and network analysis. And since 2007, uh, John has been involved in strategic research on the transformation of agricultural sectors in Africa under the Comprehensive Ag Agri Africa Agricultural Development Program agenda. In 2017 to 21, he was the Africa-wide coordinator for the Regional Strategic Analysis and Knowledge Support System. John will be talking about how this, uh, how steep is it's going to be in terms of the path to recovery in dealing with this crisis, what we can learn from historic trends from previous macroeconomic impacts, what the cost of fertilizer and the consequences of that in terms of reduced use, how fuel price increases will be affecting things, and the food prices, particularly with regards to how they affect access and supply crises. Um, he will also be talking about the early macroeconomic impacts and what kinds of policy responses we could have for that. So we're lucky we have John helping us. Third speaker is Vole Carucci. He is uh, the director of the Resilience and Food Systems Service Policy and Program Division of the World Food Program, headquartered in Rome. He has over 30 years of experience working with the UN in the areas of livelihood assets, creation, and resilience building. He's an agronomist by training, but has you know, worked on building resilience in places like uh, Ethiopia and most recently in West Africa. Um, he was a senior advisor in Eastern and Central Africa Regional Bureau from 2006 to 2008. And he has been very much involved from 2016 to mid 21, where he headed the Resilience and Livelihood Unit in WFP West and Central Africa Regional Bureau. So he's really going to be talking about how to scale up interventions that are going to help build resilience in the face of crises and how to go from a crisis response to building more resilient food systems, how bad this food crisis has become and what is immediately needed, and how to go from the crisis response to resilience using the four C's. And I'll let him explain what those four C's are. 
but we're really focusing on scaling up rehabilitation to restore production potential, how to ramp up fertilizer substitution, how to scale up local procurement of food, and how to scale up post-harvest losses solutions. So that he's gonna really be talking about real uh, examples of building resilience in, in places that WP is working. And last but not least, our final speaker will be Vidya Sredram from the Global, she's the Global Director of Village Savings and Loans Associations at CARE. Uh, Vidya is, specializes in designing and implementing programs, focusing on targeting the specific needs, constraints, and capabilities of women and girls in marginalized populations where CARE programs. Uh, she manages CARE's VSLA 2030 strategy implementation on how to scale up the strategy and that CARE has formally endorsed. Um, she has over 14 years of experience designing, managing, and fundraising for care emergency and food nutrition security portfolio. Uh, she has worked in over 30 care countries, specializing in the support of the design of integrated programs that build on care's global experience and ongoing initiatives. She's originally from India, but and holds a master's degree in public policy from the LBG School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas. He's going to be talking about the differential impact of the crisis on women, the impact of the food access and availability and food price increases, uh, the increased fertilizer costs and transport costs and how that uh, is having a negative effect on women farmers. And also she's going to be talking about how these crises have affected local currencies and how the, the currencies are losing value, which has a, a tremendous negative effect on these uh, different household folks. Um, she's also going to be talking about programming responses, where uh, about funding and how it needs to be flexible and concept, context specific, why it's important to have long-term funding, like the Feed to Future programs that are making global food systems more resilient over time, and why it's so critical to be investing in women and girl farmers. So I'm going to turn it over to Luca. Luca, it's, it's, you're on first. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, team. Uh, good, good morning or good afternoon to everyone. So what I want to say in this presentation is three or four uh, fun fundamental things. The first thing is I want to look at the issues of uh, Ukraine war and uh, resilience in a food security perspective. So the first message I would like to pass is that uh, food crises have been here for quite a, a few years, and therefore there is no new crisis, but just an additional factor, aggravating factor on existing crisis. The, 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 the slide shows you the results that are coming out from the global report on food crisis that we produce every year in, in partnership with WFP and many others under the Global Network Against Food Crisis. And it, it focuses on what we call food crisis countries, which are the countries that depend in a way or another from external humanitarian assistance to deal with the shocks and crisis. So, Look at the number. We have, uh, in the last five years, the number of almost double. Uh, and if you look at the, the country where we have, uh, we have uh, data for the, for, for, the, for the last five years, that are 38 countries, basically the number of double, and also, also in terms of prevalence. So that is uh, the Ukraine crisis come just on, on already existing, extremely fragile situation. Next slide, please. Uh, Tim mentioned the fact that there are different drivers that, that contribute to, to food, food insecurity, and there are essentially three broad categories, which is conflict, economic shocks, and weather events. And you see how important is conflict in, as, a, as a main driver of food crisis, and therefore the importance in this, in this context to have an, an approach that is taking into account also peace consideration in addition to additional uh, um, humanitarian and development uh, consideration. One thing that is important that is common to all these crises, and I would like to move to the next slides, is that most of these, the countries which are affected by food crisis are essentially countries still with a very uh, high percentage of rural population, from 60 to 80 percent. And what is in common in all these crises is that there is 
and issues of rural marginalization and fragile food system. And, and this fragility of the food system feeds and feed, and uh, each other the, the, the other driver, no? from health crisis, the COVID we mentioned, economic crisis, security, political, and environmental. So they're all interlinked, one feeding each other in terms of, of driver. And the result are uh, impacting on food uh, security and nutrition and resulting in crisis. Now, next slides. I would like to show you one example of the of the of how the crisis evolved. This is this is the cell, and I'm sure that Volley will say something also about the cell. So, in the cell, in the last four years, we have seen basically the numbers of people are facing acute food insecurity growing by four times, from 10 million to 40 40 million. And you see, we have again we have these issues of stru structural rural poverty and marginalization. As, as, as a constant factor, and then you have a number of, success, of successive shocks that affect the, 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 the food security in, in, the, in, the, in the Sahel. And the last one, the last one is the Ukraine crisis with its impact on, on raising food prices and so on. So, next slide, please. So, what is the situation today? And I've put a question mark whether we are, we are uh, in, in a situation of, of an irreversible systemic collapse ahead because maybe we are not yet too late. But the point is, on the one hand, we have an unprecedented food crisis and is driven by interlinked drivers. Countries alone, I mean, particularly, part particularly countries in fragile context, do not have the capacity and the margin to scale up response to food crisis. And in all this, the Ukraine crisis can be what we call the black swan and, and create additional burden. So, in, in a situation like this, an overall change of paradigm is required. And I will just say a few things in terms of what should be the element of this paradigm, but I, I'm sure my colleague will also, will, also, will also complement. So, there are a few things which we can consider to do or not to do. Not to do is clearly all the, and unfortunately is happening, that, that uh, countries should refrain to establish trade barriers, but uh, from our last records, there are at least 25 countries who have introduced trade barriers since, since the, the, the start of the war in Ukraine with, with consequences on, 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 the, on the food crisis, on, on the on agricultural price. Now, four elements of things that should be, should be considered. Okay, the first one, and I think there is no way out of this, is unless you are able to address and build a resilient food system, you will be still facing the same situation now during the, the Ukraine crisis and after the crisis. So the issues of, of fragile food system, and Volley will talk a lot about this, is crucial. On this, and, and it's important the word system, because we are really to think on a, on a systematic, on a system, uh, through a system approach. Let me just give you an example. At the moment, there is a lot of uh, preoccupation around the fact that uh, we need to increase local production to, to reduce uh, import, uh, import dependency, which I think is absolutely crucial in a, in a, in a factor like this. But at the same time, if you look at, at a system, approach, you have also to look at other factors. And one, one that I would like just to raise is the issues of food storage, and, and which I, I think are fundamental. I'll just give you an example, is the, the situation in, in Horn of Africa. In, in the Horn of Africa, uh, um, the Horn of Africa import each year around 10.7 million metric tons of grain, and they, at the same time, they are faced with 4.1 million metric ton of, lo of, of losses due to grain storage, um, to, the weak, to the weak system of, of, of grain storage. And think that 700,000 uh, uh, is the, is the uh, metric ton is the, is the dependency from uh, uh, humanitarian assistance. So by improving uh, the, the issues of grain storage, you could substantially reduce the need of imports and also the need of humanitarian assistance. And in this framework, there is an, an initiative that FAO, together with WFP and EGAN, is launching in the whole region that is called the One Million Grain Store Initiative. Then there are three more elements that I would like to touch. The first one is, is the issues of famine prevention. Uh, it's fundamental in a situation like this that this should be given the highest priority by decision makers. 
in, at the moment we have five countries which have people in 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 a famine situation and uh, and this is already unpre unprecedented and is already unprecedented and it will require very little to 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 have a much more massive situation of famine also in other countries so we need to closely monitoring this situation i, I can imagine i can mention somalia afghanistan uh, i can mention uh, yemen south sudan closely monitoring this situation and be able to intervene on this another key element is the issues of the of the humanitarian funding gaps uh, I'm, I've heard that, and I'm really glad that there are a number of initiatives like the G7 that may bring some additional resources. But as a fact, in the last few years, we have seen uh, a sort of, of a lack of growth in terms of humanitarian assistance while the needs were increasing. So um, we have seen the, the, the graphic at the beginning in terms of people in need. And the humanitarian assistance to the food sector in the last four or five years are, are, are remain more or less the same. So it's absolutely important that the, some of these funding gaps are closed. But at the same time, and, and I come back to the first point around the, the, the issues of, 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 uh, of resilient food system, humanitarian assistance should not be provided at the expense of long-term investments in the humanitarian sector. The last point I wanted to mention is, is the issues of coordination. At the moment, there are, I don't know how many initiatives that aims to coordinate the coordination mechanism. Coordination is fundamental, particularly around the, the HDP, HDP nexus, but at the moment it's extremely difficult for countries, particularly affected countries, to get a little bit of understanding of all these initiatives. So most probably us as international community, donor community, we should really try to make a little bit more, more order in our house and uh, try to minimize and simplify the coordination mechanism. So I will stop here and I will pass over to John. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, um, uh... Thank you very much, um, uh, Luca, and thank you for colleagues from USA to um, um, for inviting us. Uh, next, next slide, uh, uh, please. So, my, my the main uh, focus of my presentation will be how steep is the path to recovery, um, given the fact that um, the 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 Russia Ukraine war is a shock on top of already existing shocks such as COVID-19 conflict, as Luca uh, mentioned earlier. Next, next slide. So uh, I'll touch on three points. First, uh, what can we learn from uh, historical trends? Uh, this is not the first time that we have a, 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 a the volatility in what I call the three F, uh, uh, food, fertilizer, and, and, uh, and fuel. Um, and then look at uh, uh, some early simulations on the macroeconomic impact of the, uh, uh, the Russia-Ukraine war. And of course, uh, uh, complete with uh, uh, what we are observing as uh, uh, policy responses to, to, to the crisis and how is that helping or even fuel, fuel, fueling the crisis uh, further. Next, next slide. Yeah, so uh, this is the first of the three F. Uh, remember, uh, fertilizer, fuel, and, and food. And, and when you look at uh, uh, the trend uh, here, uh, you know, from um, um, 2003 all the way to in 2022, uh, this uh, monthly uh, 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 fertilizer index, you can, I mean, I highlight some, some references here. You can see some similarity between what happened in 2000, uh, 2007, 2008, and what is happening now since 2020. Um, we, after the peak in 2008, the, 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 the system, the, Seemingly, seemingly try to you know 
absorb the shock. Uh, but what is happening now um, uh, is deeper uh, than what happened then. Um, and as I said, it is the, the, the war is coming on top of existing crisis. The system hasn't yet recovered from COVID-19 and other uh, uh, conflict uh, uh, crises. So the, 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 the road to recovery might be a bit longer and even more uh, uh, expensive unless we do something right now. Uh, uh, next slide. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, uh, this is the warning from uh, IFDC uh, um, saying that uh, when, if we drop uh, the use of um, fertilizer by two uh, million ton, this will lead to uh, the loss of 30 million tons in terms of grain and an increase of 6 million of people in need of food assistance. So this is just to highlight uh, why it is so important to uh, intervene and uh, 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 divide some uh, um, strategic uh, uh, interventions uh, in response to the fertilizer uh, crisis. Uh, next slide. The, the second of the three F is, of course, the fuel. And here too, I plotted um, uh, the, uh, from uh, 2003 to 2022, and you can see with some of the, the references that the the peak uh, in 2000 uh, um, uh, March 2022 is higher than the peak in 2008. Uh, and, and when you look at the difference between the, the highest level of the, the index uh, and the lowest before the increasing trend, it, what we are experiencing now is much larger uh, in terms of the, the slope, uh, which means that the recovery uh, as, as for the fertilizer case uh, might be steeper, uh, 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 may take some time. Uh, so these all uh, are showing that there is urgency uh, 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 to act. There is a need to act to act now. Next, next slide. Next. Now, um, so we have the the fuel prices. We have the uh, fertilizer crisis. The last F is on, on food, uh, so the combination of the fact that Ukraine cereal cannot export uh, uh, the cereals, uh, uh, the food, uh, the fertilizer price increasing, fuel increasing, the combination of all of that are creating, uh, and of course, in addition to other uh, conflict, are creating this volatility in food prices. And as you can see, the, the, the again, um, with the references here, the peak in 2000, 2022, uh, April, uh, is much higher than the peak in June uh, uh, 2008. Again, showing that you know, we, there might be some similarities uh, between the two trends, the two shocks, the two stress, stressors that we, uh, we experienced. However, the one that we are seeing now is more is steeper again because it is on top of uh, already existing uh, crisis. And something that I wanted to highlight here is that what is happening now, uh, as far as food uh, price is concerned, is more on the access is, is lack of access uh, to food. Uh, so the, the 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 system, the global system, has to rest to prevent. Uh, uh, this to become a, a, a supply a crisis on top of the, 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 the access crisis, because then that will complicate uh, a lot of things. So we need to watch what will happen to the next planting and harvest seasons. If the, the globe as a whole miss the next planting and harvest seasons, then we'll see uh, 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 even uh, uh, more complicated dire situation as we are experiencing now. Next, next slide.
So, uh, and here I'm, I'll just share some early macroeconomic impact um, uh, uh, from um, my colleagues from IFPRI with support from uh, BMGF, uh, FDCO, FCDO, and, and USAID. Uh, so, what the results that uh, some of the simulation they recently uh, did are showing already reduction in GDP uh, in employment, uh, as well as uh, uh, a dire impact on uh, vulnerability uh, on, on poor households. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, it's, it's some of, some of the, the groups, social group, vulnerability, poor groups, poor households are already experiencing uh, the, the, the heat, the impact of uh, uh, Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, they, they observe uh, that urban poverty rate is increasing uh, uh, that food shocks are even causing diet quality to deteriorate. Because the prices are, are, are high, uh, households now are relying on uh, food items that are not so um, high in needed uh, uh, food uh, uh, micronutrient, which, you know, which we call the hidden uh, uh, hunger. Uh, which might cause some other issues, health related and, and also uh, and, and, and additional uh, uh, complicated uh, complicating issues as related to, 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 to the impact of the, uh, the Russia Ukraine war. Next, next slide. Next slide. So let me finish with this. Um, uh, so what are we observing in terms of policy responses? First, policy responses should match the urgency of the needs. So this is not just something that we can sit and watch and expect that it will go away. Uh, uh, it is important that we act and we act now. Um, we, unfortunately, uh, Luca mentioned that we are still seeing some trade bans, uh, which unfortunately are fueling, fueling the crisis instead of uh, 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 responding properly. Uh, so we need comprehensive uh, agriculture-based social protections, which uh, should be implemented to save the next planting seasons, as I, I mentioned. Uh, and uh, we also noticing, you know, some move for all-out fertilizer distribution, but we think this is not uh, the solution. Uh, we need to, yes, implement some subsidy, uh, smart subsidies, uh, uh, fertilizer. Uh, based on, 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 you know, we need to include, if we do that, if we go for fertilizer subsidies, it has to be time limited, uh, involve for private uh, uh, sector uh, as well. So those are the policy responses that we are observing and what we think should be uh, done, at least in the short and medium term. Uh, I will close here and pass it to my colleague Voli from uh, WFP. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John, and uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I am very pleased to be part of this uh, uh, webinar, and uh, my presentation will, uh, as Tim was saying, focus on uh, uh, emphasizing on what Luca and John were saying, the move from crisis response to more resilient food systems, underlying that we're dealing with it really with uh, the perhaps one of the most unprecedented manifestation of cumulative fragilities unfolding. Next slide, please. What uh, um, I will start from the crisis response, and Luca has shown the trends, and it is very true, and that this is on top of uh, decades of uh, uh, probably the result of uh, what you call an environmental bankruptcy degraded ecosystems uh, um, unfolding for, for and unattended for decades in, uh, in most countries, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also in Central Latin America and, uh, and part of Southeast Asia. We are really looking at uh, conflict as a huge driver. Uh, we are looking at uh, uh, social tensions and increasingly manifesting in urban settings that will be the first to get into unrest and rioting eventually if this crisis continues to, to unfold and repercussion, particularly on specific foods, will impact on urban populations as well. Um, we are really having this uh, 
this crisis generated by fuel and by by, by fuel costs, by food costs and fertilizer costs, impacting uh, you know even from the 2021 uh, uh, record high numbers that we had to assist. Now we have uh, uh, 345 million people that are acutely food insecure, of which 50 million in IPC4 means emergency, and 882,000 in IPC5. And Luca was alluded to those at the brink of famine or already facing famine-like conditions in uh, Somalia, in Yemen, in Ethiopia, in South Sudan and Afghanistan. So we are extremely concerned about that. And uh, uh, one uh, additional element that it has really increased our operational costs because alternative solutions imply, you know, higher transport costs, uh, food, uh, uh, food price costs, and so on. This part of the this part of the crisis, because this crisis may last for quite some time, it's uh, mostly an access crisis. We have enough food, but it's at the wrong place, at the wrong price, and at the wrong time. You know, it's, it's really a huge issue, but it may become very easily, uh, particularly in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the later part of the year and in 2023, also a, 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 um, an availability crisis. So, What's been done now, and I would like to take next slide, please. Um, the opportunity to to to, um, to thank, in particular, aid USAID for the, the the supplemental funds that have been made available. The first tranche is allowing us to respond to a number of uh, of these uh, hotspots and on on this uh, on this uh, crisis affected countries. It has been an incredible contribution. And uh, we've been activating, as you know, a global response with the related CONOPS and uh, deployment um, capacities and mobilization of additional resources. And we are trying really to advocate, and Luca was saying rightly so, that it's unprecedented. And um, reaching 152 million, which is our plan this year, will demand, uh, you know, a continued support, not only from, from aid, but also from other donors and, uh, and, and, and stakeholders. And our leadership are extremely busy these days, as you know, in, uh, in uh, advocating for additional resources because we need a shield. We need, we need to contain this crisis before it festers further. Um, and the focus, of course, on deployment from our side and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and priority areas. In terms, of, uh, in terms of the silver lining, you know, in, in, uh, it has been alluded to by Luca in a number of, uh, of his uh, uh, pleas for the paradigm shift. Yes, securing, uh, uh, you know, as much as possible uh, additional funds as soon as possible, but also start thinking really in how to restore uh, the, the, the functioning of uh, uh, broken or extremely fragile food systems and how to bring resilience in this, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, equation. I think that in most of the areas where we work, uh, we are not anymore you know, having the luxury to have a linear approach, but really is a concomitance, is a famous nexus of intervention that need to happen at, at the same time. So whilst we will respond to crisis, we'll also need to rebuild, to reconstruct, to reestablish you know, agricultural potential to, to rehabilitate and to, and to reverse those trends. And I would like to start, next slide, please, by citing an example of, uh, I've been just coming from, from that example, and before that example, also from the Horn of Africa, from the Ethiopian experience, when myself and Luca were there for quite a few years together, so he knows where I'm coming from. Um, but this example actually illustrates the beginning of a, a very robust shift in a number of places where we intervene in the Sahel, really within the nexus space. A uh, very fragile environment, arid and semi-arid. Arid. Let's not forget that 70% of all the crisis affected places where we intervene are arid or semi-arid. And uh, this is a package that actually started back in 2014, thanks to aid, so to the SAD, the Food for Peace at the time, that beginning to have uh, annual commitments, one after the other, to support the restoration of uh, degraded ecosystems, providing also nutrition support. And uh, through time, we were joined by an exceptional contribution from 
from Germany as well that join uh, this uh, this uh, this effort by adding additional components and expanding and scaling it up. So from 500 villages that we were beginning to work with um, with aid in 2014, we are now in over uh, over 2000, and aid continue to be a main protagonist together with all with Germany in particular and other donors. So this has you know allowed for a scale up and to move away from what we call the, the, the four big problems, scattered approach, siloed approach, short-term and, um, and small scale to what the team was alluding to, the four Cs, that we summarize into convergence, concentration or integration of efforts, uh, coverage means, meaning scale and capacity strengthening because we need to work with governments and governments have been protagonists of this since the very beginning. But this was also a platform for partnership major partnership with UNICEF, major partnership with uh, IFAD and FAO in a number of contexts, and then major partnership with some of the NGO partners, in particular like, like the RISE partners, the Resilience Initiative that was uh, uh, launched uh, um, with, uh, 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 with aid-funded NGOs as well. So how we can layer and sequence and integrate even further as we advance? It's not perfection here, but there is a lot of change uh, happening. Next slide, please. The results are um, quite impressive, not only from the output side, you know, uh, the last three years, 110,000 hectares, uh, hundreds and hundreds of shallow wells, boreholes and ponds and so on, and uh, malnutrition uh, prevention and treatment as well, plus, uh, of course, uh, the ecological restoration, putting back the foundations for food system to work again. I mean, in most cases, we are living with one or two crops. There is no food systems development. There is no market access, you know, which just depending on a few, uh, on, on, on those few, on those few uh, commodities. So how to diversify, how to bring, you know, fresh foods, how to regenerate agriculture, but also make it in a, an environmentally sustainable way. A few years down the road, we see also by measuring of outcomes, significant results reduction of hardships, 70-75%, reduction of uh, uh, um, malnutrition. It's amazing to see in some sites malnutrition going absolutely down close to almost nothing. And obviously diversification, diversification of diets, more foods being consumed and so on. Ecological changes, next slide and three clicks please, uh, if um, that was not already done. No, before. Sorry, okay, so it was in one click. So this shows that we are also tracking changes, not only through the outcome measurements, fixing type of indicators, but also GIS. This is with the AIMS project, again, support also by USAID, but also with NASA. Um, it really shows the, 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 the advancement and the, we are using also these sites to um, work with Sahel universities to generate new talents you know, a nursery of new talents that can be deployed later on uh, and join the ranks of uh, NGOs, of government, and uh, eventually also some of our UN, uh, UN agencies. All of this to say what? Is to perhaps looking at what we see governments increasingly realizing following the Ukraine crisis, the Ukraine war, is that they cannot depend that much on imported foods and uh, from uh, uh, fertilizer imports. Those will still be important. There is no question about that. But there is an increased realization of food sovereignty, of the need to put, to restore local supply chains or to strengthen them, to uh, leverage on, let's say, four opportunities. And some of them have been also very strongly uh, highlighted during the COP15 in Abidjan, I was very impressed about some of the statements and some of the thinking that we saw around the table, because those took play, uh, that COP took place, the COP on desertification took place uh, uh, a couple of months after the beginning of the Ukraine crisis. So what we could do, next slide, is to, one of the things that emanate here, more local land restoration, community-based participatory planning in thousands and thousands of communities, getting them back to produce local foods, 
millet, sorghum, cowpeas, sweet potatoes, fonios, etc. Those foods are also three or four times more nutritious than imported rice, for example. So how we can really follow some of the movements of the Grand Green Wall, uh, FAO is part of it as well, but also many of the partners, but or like type of scaling up of such kind of initiatives that will be taking the community as a center, people at the center, and be a major game changer to alleviate also hardships, particularly for women and, uh, and children. Restoring jobs is huge along those lines. So we see how that was effective for years in Ethiopia and then Rwanda, and then now we see in the Sahel in Niger and Burkina and Chad and Mali and part of Mauritania. And we can see that this is a huge opportunity for all of us. In, if we can just scale up to 10 million hectares by 2027, in five years from now, it's maybe 10 million additional tons, if not more. The second one is fertilizer substitution, not against fertilizers, but how to optimize the use of existing fertilizers through scaling up compost making. Some countries are already launching and encouraging compost making at scale, Ethiopia being the first one. By 2006, when I left Ethiopia, there was 1 million tons of compost being produced by a massive uptake of, that, of those very simple techniques, heaps or pit methods. We think that is realistic, and we have been pushing this a lot in our resilience uh, effort in the Sahel, to go to scale. This is not only through our operation or our collective programs, but also by inducing the ministries of agriculture and partners to invest in this kind of regenerative agriculture type of activities. There are different type of techniques, I'm just citing one, but going to scale with this means millions of tons, means a better use of existing fertilizers. 10 to 40 percent, an agro report from last year, of fertilizer application in Africa end up with no response. The soils are not responding. The, th the third one, local procurement of local foods, local nutritious foods as well, how we can ramp that up, creating local value chain, job creation, processing, bagging, reducing supply chains, improving access to markets, is diversification healthy and diversified markets and affordable prices will, will really propel food security in a number of these contexts a lot. And finally, the post-harvest losses, Luca mentioned to it. Silos, but also construction, storage improvement, training, roof formation, working at, in the different segments of the value chain of the of the of the all the chain from 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 bagging to uh, using a combination of local and modern technology to uh, uh, improve storage, transport, and preservation of produce. There are a number of things that we are doing as WFP as part of our uh, efforts in local in the within the, the context of the local and regional uh, food procurement policy and the SAMS work and the PHL work. But this is a huge opportunity for partnership. I'm glad that Luca mentioned about uh, that, that that initiative that we're going to we're engaged in discussions with uh, with FAO and IFAD. But this provide uh, requires another another uptake. We cannot allow 20, 25 percent of the 170, 180 million tons of food of crop produce in Africa get lost uh, every year. It's uh, it's simply not possible. So these are four ideas out of many. Uh, a few that we could scale up and are informed by practice. They are just making them solutions and translate them into actions in, in itself already an innovation. Thank you very much. Handing over to Tim. I uh, know to, sorry, sorry, to Vidya. Apologies. No worries. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to, to the organizers for having me um, and thanks, Molly, for that. So I'm going to sort of follow on with what all of the presenters have already said, right? John spoke about the three Fs, which I too will address, but uh, even before the war in Ukraine, um, the three Cs, climate change, COVID, and conflict, uh, led to almost 200 million people being severely hungry. So as the presenters have said, um, the war has dramatically worsened the situation, but particularly for women, and that's the thing I wanna focus on for the next few minutes is how what affects the world writ large 
has an even more disparately negative and long-term effect on um, poor women globally. So uh, before I dive into the presentation, I just wanna lay out that CARE has been running a digital survey of women in uh, BSLA specifically for the past 18 months. And it was uh, driven by the need to understand the impact of COVID on their lives and livelihoods and their savings specifically. And we found out that in those 18 months, so between 2020 and uh, you know this year, um, the impact on food security has increased two to three times over, meaning that people are three times less food secure today than they were in 2020. So if we're talking about compounding crises, conflict, COVID, climate change, and now the war in Ukraine, um, people are really suffering and the impacts are gonna get worse and worse. The slightly good news is that uh, when we looked at the survey data between people in savings groups and not, uh, people in savings groups are faring about 50% better in areas of food security, health, um, the ability to continue productive activities. But again, because this is a compounding crisis, that is going to reduce. Their savings capacities are going to re reduce. Their resources are being depleted at uh, precipitously. Um, and they're using what they have to support basic household consumption needs. So the delivery of cash and aid is slow to reach them, slower than, than their need. So uh, Voli asked the question, how do we bring resilience to the situation? And what I'd say from what we've seen in the past 18 months is that savings is core to building that resilience. So I'll come back to this at the end, but any uh, programming approaches should support savings habits um, ongoing. Um, next slide. So I'm also going to follow follow the lead of the others, please, um, and talk about the, the three Fs. So one of the hardest hit areas, one of the hardest hit areas as a result of the Ukraine crisis, uh, and what we've done is looked mostly at Sub-Saharan Africa, um, is the availability of fertilizer and agricultural inputs. To be clear, women already had challenges accessing inputs prior to this crisis. Um, most of them are not considered farmers in the first place. So inputs weren't reaching them, but now limited access to fertilizer combined with drought, food price increases, um, and everything else have resulted in low yields. So whatever is being harvested is being used for immediate consumption rather than sale. Um, so in Malawi, for example, the cost of inputs is three times higher than in October 2021, which tracks with uh, you know, the increase came March and April of this year, corresponding to the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, in Sierra Leone, we just found out seed prices have almost tripled. So they were a dollar and a half for a bag of peanut seeds uh, in October. They're five dollars now. This is cost prohibitive for poor rural women. Um, next slide, please. I'm gonna go faster so we can save some time for Q&A. Um, with food access, nearly 50 countries depend on Russia and Ukraine for about 30% of their wheat imports. I think that's been said. But beyond wheat, there are attendant disruptions in the supply chains across the board. So foodstuffs, including wheat, but also things like sunflower oil, which are critical to uh, you know, small scale production or, or sale of, and trade in countries like Tanzania and Malawi have been really grossly impacted. So in Tanzania, for instance, food prices have gone up all over the country, including in villages. And similarly in Malawi, maize prices have doubled, in some cases tripled. So when stable food prices go up precipitously like this, we see that women specifically face the most severe burdens in food security. Um, and the poorest segments, women particularly, spend over 60% of their income on food. So when food prices go up like this, uh, women are eating less, uh, nutrition goes down, as Wally had um, indicated. So all of the gains that we've made in the past few years uh, are really sliding back because of COVID, because of conflict, and now because of this crisis. So the consequence of all of this, um, despite the role that women play in producing and preparing food, they're going to be eating last. Um, and during times of acute food insecurity, like we are now, uh, they're at a higher risk of uh, experiencing other issues like gender-based violence um, and other forms of exploitation and abuse because stress levels are high in households. Um, and the the other thing I will come back to later is that they're also consistently shut out of crisis response uh, and denied the chance to apply their deep community knowledge 
to ongoing solutions. And this is another thing that we've seen during uh, our survey of women in uh, VSLAs is that not only do they continue saving through this and every other crisis, uh, they're also supporting community level response. So they're with their own savings, not lending, they're just giving money to community members who are starving effectively. Um, so if we're talking about building resilience, this seems to be a key way we should continue doing so. Uh, next slide, please. So what you'll see uh, is a, a quote from one of the participants uh, in one of our VSLAs. And I'll let you read that. But the combination of crises, ongoing violence in the re uh, regions where we're talking about, and gender inequality are dramatically hindering the ability of women to produce food for themselves, their families, and the region. So some of our respondents in, in Sierra Leone, for example, indicate farmers are only planting half the land they were last year because they cannot um, afford seeds and fertilizer. Uh, women are cutting market visits from once a week to once a month. So they can't sell products as often as they used to uh, because they buy, can't buy the inputs, they can't afford uh, the price of the inputs, and they also can't buy food, and that's getting worse. So again, these crises are compounding. Um, next slide, please. So, um, uh, Foley and John both mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, WFP's response has been slowed down as, as well. So, over the past 10 years, Ukraine has become one of WFP's bigger suppliers of food, which has impacted the humanitarian food pipeline in places like Nigeria and Ethiopia. So, insufficient fuel means that uh, CARE, WFP, the humanitarian community at large, is going to continue to struggle to dispatch commodity supplies from warehouses nearby to distribution centers. So fuel prices are really uh, hindering the ability to distribute aid. Uh, so in Ethiopia, for example, uh, the shortage of fuel coupled with every other challenge, cash, communication, infrastructure, access to basic services, this is all hindering uh, the food distribution system. So 13 million people in Ethiopia, in northern Ethiopia, are in need of humanitarian assistance, and that's 4 million more people than in uh, November of 2021. So the increased cost of fuel also means that women, who could already not afford the price of transporting their goods to market, um, are even further displaced. So the costs are not just prohibitive, uh, but when combined with the cost of inputs to produce food, the compounding crisis of COVID climate change, conflict, uh, mean that food isn't being grown and consumed at local levels. So not even for sale or profit, but not even for subsistence. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the last thing I'll, I'll talk about is um, it, price. So in import dependent countries like Malawi and Tanzania, weaker currencies have an impact on inflation and also the price of basic commodities. And all of this will then have an attendant impact on the poorest of the poor. Uh, who aren't by any means insulated by, from any of these uh, economic knock-on effects. So if you're thinking about the lady who sells fritters on the side of the road, uh, the cost of wheat and the cost of oil have doubled, in some cases tripled. So her costs for producing that fritter have tripled, which is cost prohibitive for her. Um, and currency fluctuations affect uh, required capital to trade in imported basic goods, which means that women are lowering their ability to trade, sell, negotiate even further, um, and people are resorting to subsistence farming and the gains we've made over the past decade in getting women access to inputs, markets, fair prices in those markets that are being rolled back significantly. Um, last slide, please. So, in terms of programmatic response, I, I agree with, with what the others have uh, said, and I'll deepen that insight just a little bit. So with this and any other crisis, women are the most impacted. I think I've driven that point home. So getting in aid into their hands is, is going to be critical. And one of the most significant insights we've had from polling you know, over 8,000 women in eight countries over the past 18 months is that uh, when they have access to savings and they save e even during a crisis. So we did this even in Yemen, combining cash assistance with savings. Um, they save 50% of their cash assistance. Um, and they support broader community level response. So 60% of the VSLA members we were surveying are giving money and food to communities during COVID. But that's gonna taper off. 
savings are being depleted and unless the development community speeds up its support specifically to women in the form of cash, vouchers, um, those are the things that are needed to support immediate need. Um, so I completely agree with Bali that moving to production of local foods is critical to ongoing resilience. Um, and the people who will do this in climate adaptive ways are women, but also investing in their savings capacities is going to be critical to building their ongoing resilience. Um, the second point I'll make is that the 2008 global food crisis came out after two seasons of drought. The current crisis comes after four seasons of drought, and COVID and conflict, and now the war in Ukraine. I mean, the compounding realities are, are mind boggling. So we have to drastically scale up humanitarian response um, through programs like Feed the Future, um, which support long-term resilience, which I think is key to this and any ongoing uh, crisis response. Um, and then the last thing is, as I've said over and over, addressing gender inequality is core to our continued response. Um, Addressing gender inequality would feed up to 150 million people more worldwide, um, but women need access to productive, productive resources, and ownership of land is going to be central to that. Um, and they're going to be centered, central to any response ongoing. Um, so we are experiencing truly unprecedented layers of crisis but women have to be at the center of uh, our ongoing res uh, response and resilience building initiatives. So let me pause there and hand it back over to Tim. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everybody. This this was really uh, uh, a great great presentations. So we have some questions that are coming from the audience, and I, I'll I'm going to first ask uh, John uh, why you know w one one person asked uh, why were the drops in fuel so severe um, in certain times over the last several years, and why are these very low points prior to high points? Um, in both 2008 and now 2022. Can you explain that? Uh, uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, uh, the, the, the point of reference is um, that I, I use uh, for 2008 and 2022. Um, uh, the point of the shocks, uh, that's, that's what the, the, they are. Um, um, in 2008, 2007, 2008, this was financial uh, uh, shocks um, again created uh, in addition to other shocks uh, here in between 2020 and 2022 uh, you have COVID uh, shock uh, as a, in, in general uh, you still have some conflict here and there and then on top of that uh, uh, we have the uh, the war uh, in, in Russia and, and Ukraine so every time there is a shock there is a peak uh, now. It, you know the reasons are, are different. Back then, uh, we had a financial crisis uh, combined to some weather-related uh, uh, shocks as well. Here you have uh, COVID-19. Uh, in addition to some also weather-related shocks uh, and uh, uh, the the war, um, uh, Russia, um, uh, Ukraine uh, war. So every time there is a shock, uh, there is a peak. Uh, we just need to uh, know how to manage, how to uh, um, rebound or to absorb the effect of the shock, and that's building the resilience of uh, of uh, the the system. So that's that will be my uh, my answer. Okay, thanks, John. Um, Volley. So one of the things that uh, you were talking about was um, right now it's an access crisis in terms of food security but it could turn into being a, an availability crisis if it continues through 2023. How can you ensure that uh, some of the grain surplus producing countries are going to be able to make sure that there's enough food available uh, in the US, Australia, Argentina, some of these places that are producing lots of grain will be available uh, to help deal with in the short term with this possible availability crisis? 
No, thank you. Thank you, Tim. I wish I had the straight answer. Um, unfortunately, I, I think that, uh, okay, first of all, I would think that there is, there is, uh, there is enough food out there to begin to uh, buy. It's going to be more expensive, but uh, it's a matter of resources and and planning and looking also within the places where we need food uh, the most at the substitution localization. We are, for instance, uh, undertaking supply demand analysis as we speak. There are still opportunities. Um, it's also to establish new relationship with traders. It's uh, negotiating, you know, putting more, as I was saying, suggesting maybe more more degraded land back to production. Uh, foods that will be adjusting better to drought conditions, to difficult conditions, backed up by uh, proper pro proper regenerative agricultural techniques. But in the meantime, I'm afraid that we will still be facing um, funding gaps, even to buy available food. Uh, if those can be averted, and I think that they need to be averted pretty quickly because we're talking about a cascading effect here that will have repercussions far beyond even the, the crisis affected areas where we used to have operations. And I was saying at the beginning that one of the analyses here is also the impact on urban context. Urban context where, you know, all the supply chains depend a lot on transportation, where different type of foods and transmission of, uh, and, and, and price transmissions uh, uh, are, are also quite, quite, quite delicate. The, it's difficult to predict at this moment, for example, for the countries that heavily depend on fertilizer imports without having enough of those commodities, what will happen in the next season, particularly for crops that need fertilizer application at specific moment of their growth. And 70% of production in Africa, for example, is about maize. And you all know that maize without uh, the proper fertilization at the right moment will not produce very much, will make as a uh, Lydia was saying, uh, will not make even profitable to, to put uh, uh, to start cultivation. So it's, it's difficult to know at this point in time what will be the cascading effect of, of this crisis. But we believe that there is enough commodity out there in Argentina, Canada, US, including Europe uh, for 2022, but also for 2023, uh, eventually, if we, if we uh, uh, um, invest uh, in, with the right resources is going to be probably more expensive, but uh, providing the resources to uh, at least buy some time. It's going to be important to buy some time and to provide an unprecedented effort to meet the current needs because those will be probably the, 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 the ones, if unattended, generating a domino effect. That's our biggest fear. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Bali. Um, so, Bidya, one of the one of the things that you brought up when you were talking about um, how to respond, that if uh, if we could provide more money, uh, cash transfers to people in the short term to allow them to to manage some of these shocks, particularly women, how would that not affect the commodity prices uh, in the markets? Wouldn't if you if you're distributing a lot of money, wouldn't that also drive up the price of commodities? And how do you make sure that uh, there's a balance there? Yeah, the, the way that I would answer that is um, cash distribution for the most part, if given to women, which isn't always the case, given to women is used for household level consumption. The other thing that I would really emphasize is we have um, started a program where we are uh, putting the SLAs in places where they traditionally have not been which is in conflict settings so yemen syria turkey and we're doing this along with cash distribution and what we are seeing is that the hypothesis was uh people aren't going to be saving when they're basically using that cash for household immediate needs and consumption um that was wrong what we found is that people are saving that for ongoing resilience building so 50 percent of what they receive uh 
in cash distributions are being saved. So I would say I would encourage us, CARE, WFP, USA, to get together and figure out how wherever you're distributing cash, how do you set up a VSLA and bridge the gap? That's the nexus um, that I would say is core to our, any ongoing solution. Um, and you know, I don't, I don't think it's going to dis, uh, disrupt local markets. We have not seen any ev evidence of that where we've set up VSLAs in um, conflict zones. Um, so I would say that, that that is a perfect silver bullet solution that we, we've just kind of stumbled on. And uh, I would encourage USA, WFB, and others to really consider do, doing that. Great. Thanks, Vidya. Luca, a question I have for you. Um, with this rising crises and, and these potential systems failures that are happening out there, um, one of the things that ha is happening, in fact, even in publications you have shared with me, is that there's a shift in the funding away from more of this resilience building to more of the humanitarian response. There has been an increase of 25% of money going to humanitarian at the cost of money that would have been going to the resilience building. How do you deal with that? Because one of the concerns in this HDP nexus is to make sure that we continue to have these long-term investments, like what Voli was talking about, but at the same time, you have these immediate needs that you've got to deal with that are where all these famine situations and all of these increases in, in IPC four and five all over the world, you're gonna to have to continue to have these humanitarian responses that are gonna take more and more resources. So how do you ensure that that balance is, is maintained? Okay, thank you for the easy question, Tim. And uh, uh, ju just two or three observations. Okay, oh. can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, sorry, because all of a sudden I, the screen disappeared. Just two or three, th two, three uh, points from, from my side. Uh, there are different ways to do humanitarian assistance and, uh, and uh, for instance, Volley illustrated how to use also food assistance to, to build resilience. From, from, FA, from FAO, we think that uh, using humanitarian assistance in the agriculture sector is a way to mitigate uh, future humanitarian, humanitarian needs. So, and particularly if you uh, use this for anticipatory action, that means intervening before the crisis fully manifested. So, on the one hand, there is uh, let's say, a more strategic use of humanitarian assistance that remain, remain, remain fundamental. On the other hand, and the other point I wanted to raise is, is that we all know that even in the, in the worst uh, crisis situation, uh, people keep do, doing agriculture and keep c cultivating. So it is absolutely essential that even in the most difficult situation, there is, there is, there is a, a a funding that goes to the agriculture agriculture sector, and there and there the coordination between humanitarian development actor is is fundamental. There is a lot of overlap there, and and sometimes there is also a need to have sort sort of area based approach where different stakeholders uh, contribute in the in different areas al along the nexus. So maybe areas of concentration. Maybe a little bit more selective in terms of area to, to, to focus. There is because because there are clearly more, more fragile areas which are uh, hard to reach where people don't like to intervene because of difficult to have success. But we really need to to invest into this. And this is a, a bit what what we are trying to do as FAO. We don't have the 150 million target of WFP, but uh, as FAO we we aim at a service at least 60 million people next year in the area of agriculture and using really a sort of continuum between humanitarian anticipatory action and resilience. Thank you. Thanks, Luca. Um, we're, we're about out of time. We, we, we're, we're actually out of time, actually. Um, but one of the things that we had a couple of more questions and maybe if our, our panelists can look at some of those questions and maybe send a response to those people. But one of the questions had to do with um, before the war uh, in Ukraine, we had a lot of countries that were food insecure and facing severe food crises. But since the war, there probably have been additional countries that have been added to this uh, list. And so we're trying to figure out 
what to do about those. And I think the work that IPRI, WP, and, and FAO have been doing can help us answer that question. And then also people want to know something about the food situation in Ukraine itself. How has the war affected that? Again, I think uh, the various organizations that we have represented here can help us answer that. Just to conclude our, our webinar, I just wanted to point out that it's been great to have these various speakers give different perspectives, that we have to recognize that um, these this crisis has compounded the effect on all of these other crises that are already existing. As Vidya said, the three Cs, the conflict, the COVID, and the climate change shocks. And then you add on top of this, this Ukraine shock, all of this has just made things worse, and uh, we have to continue to keep our eye on the ball and try to do something about this, both in the short term, but also recognizing that we have to make these longer term investments if we're really going to solve the problem. I think the other thing that was really nice about what John was talking about is that we've been here before, but what's been different about this versus 2008 is that it's much worse because of these other compounding crises that we're dealing with. and we need to make sure that we have the appropriate policy response to deal with that. Bali pro provided a great opportunity to see that there are investments that can be made uh, to actually build resilience in the face of these kinds of shocks. But in the short term, we got to make sure that we have a response to deal with the food insecurity that's increasing. But at the same time, we try to make sure that we're trying to have fertilizer substitution, that we're trying to improve upon harvest loss, that we're trying to increase local food production. All of these things will enable these communities to be less dependent on these import shocks that are happening. And then finally, Vidya really brought our attention to the fact that there are different vulnerabilities uh, in gender and that we need to make sure that women who are most severely affected by these shocks uh, are not forgotten about, and that we try to make sure that investments continue for fo those folks, that uh, VSLAs can be an important part of that investment. But at the same time, we need to recognize that transfers, such as cash transfers, are going to be critical for enable people to manage all of these supply uh, input shocks. So thank you very much for attending. I think it's been a great uh, panel, and uh, we look forward to sharing you with you the both the, the slides and the recording in the future. I turn it back over to Sophie. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, please be sure to follow along on resiliencelinks.org for more content and keep an eye on your inboxes for a post event email. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Tim. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone.